Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. We got a great guest today. Um, I'm really excited about it. Uh, we have a technologist, a law school dean. We have an online mediation expert. We have different perspectives, and we're going to talk about artificial intelligence. Uh, today, we have Brian Pappas joining us. He's the current chair of the American Bar Association Section of Dispute Resolution. Um, so I have to be uh, the dean of the University of North Dakota Law School. Two very demanding tasks at the same time. So Brian's an expert in juggling responsibilities. Um, we have Susan Guthrie with us, who's an expert in online mediation. That's why I wanted her to come and talk with us. But again, Susan does lots of different things. She's an odd award-winning podcast host. Um, she's a trainer. Um, she's an attorney. Um, there's probably more that she does that she can tell us about. She's also the chair elect for this section of dispute resolution. And uh, Iman Kardashian has joined us today. Um, I became acquainted with him just a day ago. Um, he's the sibling of somebody that's very active in our section of dispute resolution. I'm really excited that we have this connection because Iman has been involved with technology for at least 20 years. Um, he founded a company, Launched Labs, but he's got lots of other experience too. And I'm really interested and excited to hear from him. One thing I like about participating in these programs is that I always learn something. And I anticipate I'm going to learn a great deal from, from our three guests today. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I thought we could start a discussion just very generally and ask you, how are you using the AI yourselves? And how are you witnessing others using it? And we can just kind of free flow conversation, move between people. Maybe I'll start with uh, with Susan. Uh, well, it's it, it's interesting. I use it all day, every day, but for the most part, it's um, large language model generative AI in the form of Chat GPT, um, Bing, uh, Bard. I, I I'm sort of a universal user these days. I'll use any of them and all of them all day long. Um, and I use them throughout. You mentioned all the different things that I do. I I use them. Um, throughout my day in a variety of different ways to support both my practices um, as well as my trainings, my presentations. Um, I find it an incredible tool uh, due to its creativity. So it's it's a constant for me now. Uh, hey, Brian? Well, I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum. So I, um, I, I've played with it. I've uh, explored it. I think it's really interesting. Um, but I haven't used it. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm actually, um, I have a lot of people here at the uh, law school who are uh, extremely engaged in AI and, and utilizing it, thinking about it. It's just not something that I, I go to on a daily basis. But, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll come back to you and I have to ask you because as, as head of the law school, you know that your students are using it. And, you know, there's got to be concerns at your law school with your faculty and also with the students between themselves. Is, and what are people doing? Is somebody getting an advantage over me that I don't have? Um, do they have access to the resources that I don't have just because they happen to have more money or better computer or better online connections? Um, so there's a lot we can talk about in that in the academic environment. Um, Iman, um, uh, we could probably just sit back now and let you start to talk about your experiences because you've been doing it all your professional life. But if you could talk a little bit about what you've been doing. Sure. Um... You know, uh, started my interest in AI as a, a young kid, really, writing uh, AI-powered chess and learned about neural networks 20-plus uh, years ago in college. I uh, had a job where I wrote image recognition software where we actually used neural nets to identify pathology and brain CTs. And my company today, we use uh, ChatGPT API calls to essentially automate the process of building backends for games. Me personally, I'm using ChatGPT all day, every day. I'm either using it to write code, so I'm not going to type a bunch of code myself, but I am going to um, create some context where ChatGPT can kind of understand what I want to accomplish, and I'll let it, you know, write the code, and I'll read the code and, uh, you know, iterate with it. Um, I find that that's probably 20 30% faster than if I just try to write the code myself. Um, and I use it, um, our product uses ChatGPT because we're essentially um, automating the, the, the um, you know, writing code uh, in a way where 
Um, problems are solved without a human needing to kind of spoon feed a, a web interface. And then personally, if I need to write an important email, um, I find it helpful to kind of try to provide some context, maybe provide my first draft and then ask GPT to um, give me the next draft. And some things I'll take and some things I won't. Um, so yeah, all day, every day. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's an amazing thing. My daughter's getting married uh, in a week. And um, so far, I've re resisted the temptation to go to chat GPT to have it write my, my toast. Um, but we'll see how it goes. You know, if I'm struggling, let me give it the well, temptation. Well, you, um, could, you could write your post and then you could say, hey, chat GPT, what do you think of this? Maybe you write one that's too long and you want GPT to condense it. Um, and then that's just another pair of eyes, really. It's just a uh, yeah. free opinion. Yeah. I, I think I should be, don't feel guilty about it. I should, yeah. I should just, Embrace I should just it. dive in and use it. I did use it to, to I, asked a, I, I asked it to write a story about a Swede who doesn't like Ludafisk. And if you know anything about Scandinavia, Ludafisk are, you know, are one of the main holiday dishes. I had it in my lifetime. I can't say I liked it. I tried it. So I'd probably fall into that camp, but it wrote this really sweet story about this person that didn't like Ludafisk and you know, all his, all his neighbors were concerned about him and they wanted to, wanted to teach him to like it. It was really, really was quite a, what would have been a nice children's story. I think yeah. it was quite impressive. Um, so, uh, Susan, so you're using all kinds of different ways. What are some of the most advantageous ways you've used it? How do you think it's been most helpful? You know, it's it's taken a lot of the, um, I'll call it grunt work, out of my day. It will help me with things that used to take up a lot of my time. And so it frees me up for more of what I would like to be doing. So, for example, when I need to come up with content for social media marketing for my podcasts, um, it will help me create that content. And in an entire marketing plan for the episode, for the week, for the month, whatever it might be, it'll help me pull together the script um, and the, the title. I like clickbaity titles that people are going to want to click on. I actually use that phrase in ChatGPT. Here's my topic. Help me come up with a clickbaity title. It knows what clickbaity means. Um, it will help me do the research and pull together some of the facts, especially today. You know, Chat GPT rejoined up with Bing, so it now has the ability to search for information on the internet. Um, so, you know, I use it for marketing purposes, for creative purposes. Uh, we also use it in our trainings. We use it in um, a variety of different ways in trainings, both helping us to come up with content and materials for the training participants, but also when they are doing role play exercises, they can now do role play exercises with chat GPT as their role play partners. Um, so they can either be the mediator or they can be one of the participants and chat GPT can play all the other roles so they can try out new skills over and over again and then actually get feedback on how they did from chat GPT and then ask chat GPT to do another role play to challenge them on what they needed work on. Um, so we use it there. And then I also use it quite a bit. I actually use it in mediations. I do family mediations. Um, and so coming up with options is often the real meat of the matter. You know, what are we going to do with the marital residence? And sometimes the parties exhaust their ideas and I've exhausted mine as a professional. And we'll, one of my clients likes to say, let's ask the robot, you know, what some other options might be. And then you can ask ChatGPT, well, what are the pros and cons? You can, can you make a chart of the pros and cons of all these options? So as they said, all day, much like Iman, you know, all day, every day, I find a new use for um, this type of capability to really augment what I'm doing, whatever it is in that moment, whether it's my marketing, my, my process, working with my trainees or um, working with clients. So you kind of, you have described some of the things that in your training programs that, that artificial intelligence has allowed you to do. Do you have any concern that 
hey, they're not going to need me that much anymore. Um, once once I get this thing down, operating perfectly, well, it's going to take over my job as trainer. Um, is there any concern about that? That that it's going to usurp or take over some of the tasks you do so efficiently and effectively that you're going to become obsolete? You know, I don't I don't see it that way because especially in, in the field in, in which I practice family law and just dispute resolution, that personal touch and the ability to have empathy and the ability to um, connect with the parties, rapport, trust, all of those things. Chat GPT, I know people think that it's like the great and powerful Oz behind a curtain and there's some little man typing away because it it writes so realistically and convincingly and quickly. Uh, but it's really just a, a and, and Iman will be able to explain this better, but it's really just a program that knows the next word to put in after the word that it just put in in a, in a sequence. And so, it, you know, I, I don't believe, I, I believe that we can use it to augment what we do. I don't believe that it's going to replace what we do in working with people, which is all of the different aspects that I use it in. You know, I'm reaching out to people in marketing. I'm, I'm trying to connect with them through the marketing materials. I'm connecting with my trainees and trying to give them tools to become better at what they do. Um, and then also, you know, just in the mediation process itself. But you still have to be able to go through those options with the people in a personal way. Brian, um, you know, as head of the law school, kind of the buck stops here. You know, at the end of the day, you're kind of responsible for what happens in your law school. So what are some of the things that are coming to your desk? What are some of the concerns that maybe students are bringing or maybe faculty are bringing? What are the kinds of things you're hearing? You know, I'm, I'm hearing a lot from our faculty. So we have, we have a, a very engaged group and they're forward thinking. And uh, two of our faculty members in particular, uh, Tammy Oltz and Carolyn Williams, have really jumped into AI uh, both in terms of their teaching and in terms of potential impacts. And um, in, in fact, this week, uh, Greg Brockman, uh, who is the co-founder of OpenAI, and he also happens to be a University of North Dakota, a former University of North Dakota student, and he's from Thompson, North Dakota, uh, spoke uh, here on campus and, and generated a lot of interest in this subject. Uh, the, the concerns that are coming forward are that this is going to completely transform the practice of law. And that we have to change almost everything that we're doing in order to account for that. So, for example, we know uh, from other research that uh, AI can do very well on a law school essay exam. Uh, right now, roughly at a C plus uh, level, we also know that AI can draft a, a brief uh, to a, a B minus or to a B plus level. And as the technology improves. It's not going to be C plus, uh, B minus, B. It's going to be A plus. It's going to continue to adapt uh, almost to the extent where is it, is it something where we have to have someone go behind it to, uh, you know, check it to make sure that it's right. We're going to get to a point where some of the tasks that an associate would do are no longer needed. Uh, it's going to replace a lot of the, um, a lot of the document review work that is currently going on. So how do we change our classes in lawyering skills and in other areas in order to account for this new technology? And what is the value add for attorneys? Um, we used to have a lot more control over both the information that people utilize to do their legal research um, and that the information and the process itself, and that is going to be changing. And so how do we as a law school change with it? Now, we don't have as much concern from students on this front, um, mainly because we're unique and that we do not have a curve. So we're not in a situation at our law school in which the students are competing against one another. We still do give a, a class rank, but it is one of the reasons why I think we have a very happy group of law students here. They don't feel that pressure that comes from a curb situation. So I don't think there's concerns, at least none that have been expressed to me, that, well, someone's got access to this and they don't have access to that. But we know Lexus has come out with uh, AI and, and new applications, and this is only going to get better. 
And I'm really thankful that we have good folks here who are thinking about how we can adapt our curriculum and enable the lawyers of the future to be able to utilize the tool in the best possible way. All of us in the, in the legal field, I've heard the story about the attorney in New York who had a chat GPT write the brief. And a brief was written that looked really polished and professional. But the problem was that the case citations in there were, were fantasy. They had been made up. There, was, there were no such cases. Unfortunately, that person didn't go back through it carefully, confirmed that those were real cases, and actually filed a brief with the court. And there were consequences for him, um, both on the yeah, professional licensing level. Um, so, yeah, it can be really helpful. But, you know, as Susan has expressed and Iman has expressed and Brian expressed, it's not quite to the point where we can let it go. Um, Iman, so I, I don't even know where to start with you because you have so much knowledge and experience, but I'm just going to let you talk a little bit about what you want to talk about. Sure, sure. I think um, when Susan described how she used ChatGPT, she said, uh, I, I put um, clickbaity in my context, right? So that right there tells you she's an expert. She understands her field and she's using ChatGPT to uh, take care of the, the tedious parts of it. But you still need the designer you know, if you want to use it effectively, you have to um, go one click up, right? You're more of a designer and you're, you're outsourcing the, the tedious parts of your work um, and it can be very effective. But her expertise is still a requirement because I couldn't get ChatGPT to produce a marketing plan because I'm, I'm not an expert in, in that field. So um, th that's one case. Uh, the other thing I would say is um, in regards to the case in New York, what is ChatGPT? It is not a source of infinite knowledge. So if I want to count on ChatGPT to know everything in the world, it doesn't. And in fact, they're very clear, like we scanned the internet, you know, two years ago. But even that scan, the purpose wasn't to turn it into a knowledge base. The purpose was to make it good at synthesizing conversation. So if I wanted to build an app, that that wrote legal briefs, I would have it make a call to LexisNexis and I would parse those and voila, you know, the problem that that person ran into wouldn't happen just as a matter of SLA, just as a matter of how we wrote the application. So yes, um, ChatGPT isn't, you know, at the place where you can just let go and let it make decisions. You do need to um, bring in and insert an expertise but given an application is able to insert an expertise, it can be much, much more powerful than the web interface that people think of when they think about ChatGPT. I think to Brian's point, um, you know, he's in the education field and how do you deal with the fact that his industry or your industry is changing so rapidly? And you know what? So is mine, right? Like programmers and attorneys are the most impacted groups by AI. And it's very hard to um, predict how it's going to look in five years, but it's very easy to predict how it's going to look today. Um, but if we want to go out on a limb, um, you know, today it looks like people are using it to get, you know, maybe a 30% um, better use of their time, 20 to 30%, where they're able to go one click up and, and outsource the TDM. Um, maybe in a year, someone will write that app where briefs are automatically generated and, and all of the case law is relevant. So now going through LexisNexis isn't so, um, you know, uh, it's not such a coincidence that you find the right case. Like here, here are the right cases. Um, and, you know, I don't know where it's going to be in five years, but as, as Brian points out, it's not going to get worse. It's only going to get better. So my recommendation is to really um, embrace the tools that are there today. And I think that you're always going to need legal minds. Um, AI cannot sustain itself. All it's doing is pulling from the vast um, experiences that, that, that it is trained on. And, and so what you get is um, just more efficient brief writing. And I don't think there's any shortage of, of briefs to be written. So if you could do that in, in an hour as opposed to a week, I think, uh, you know, most people would take that. You know, I, I find that fascinating because 
it, it's and my mind goes in two directions uh, with what Iman said. One is that um, you still we deal with people in conflict, right? Some of it's uh, formal disputes, some of it's less formal um, conflict resolution situations. Um, it, it's all people, right? So you still have to have the, the the people skills and utilize the tool. And I think that that when I think about the value add for for lawyers. Uh, for for law students who are preparing to be lawyers, and what we do in dispute resolution, how how do you provide that value add, the communication, the relationship building, those pieces? I think I think that's a, a really important piece to this. And then the other uh, thing that I I think about is that these are these are tools that are going to constantly be adapting, um, that we need to figure out how to integrate with and and learn from and 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 um, you know, I, I think back to the old uh, uh, calculators, uh, right? There's a point at which they're not interested in whether you can can do the long multiplication and division. We we can do that. So these are tools, and how do we utilize those to help people make better decisions? And it, it's so much fun to hear Susan talk about the ways in which she integrates it. And and I agree. I, I'm not worried that that Susan's going to be out of uh, uh, out of work. Uh, as as she uses utilizes these tools, my my view is that she's going to be even more in demand because she's providing these opportunities uh, for for her clients. I think it's it's really exciting. Yeah, yeah, that makes me. Oh, I'm sorry, what, Susan. No, you. No, I was just what what Brian just said reminded me. We were just um, at the ABA annual meeting, and there was a sign posted um, there that said. AI won't replace lawyers, but lawyers who use AI will replace lawyers who don't. And I, I believe that is very, very true. And so when you were talking, Brian, about, you know, what the role for a law school curriculum is at this point, I think integrating training on how to responsibly and effectively use the tool of AI in the practice is going to become something. I've been doing um, some workshops, hands-on workshops, teaching lawyers and mediators how to use chat GPT to support their practice. And they keep selling out because they it's just people want to know how the tool works. And I can tell you, you know, they get in the room, they're nervous. They get in the virtual room. I do them online, but they're nervous about it. And then I send them off into a breakout room to do the hands-on first exercise to try it. And my favorite part is when they all repopulate the Zoom room and they're all like kids on Christmas morning, just like, oh my God, isn't this? And everyone gets very excited, but we do need to temper all of this. It's very easy to get excited. We do need to temper that excitement with these guardrails that that we need all these things that that you're talking about so it's not like we can just run out and tell everyone to start using it in a professional sense yeah well i think that's a great point about law schools having to take some responsibility to start introducing students to how we can use these tools and how can we ethically use these tools i've taught in two business schools and three law schools and my experience is that law schools are not nearly as innovative as, as business schools in terms of getting ahead of things on the, on the edge of emerging technologies. So I think that's a good call out that law schools, we need to start being a little more enthusiastic and aggressive about tackling some of these areas. You know, as, as technology expands and improves, a lot of people have celebrated it by saying that oh, this is really a great leveler. Um, it's going to increase access to justice. It's going to put people on a, on a level playing field. There's other people who say, say, wait a minute. Um, you know, this is, it's always about wealth and there are institutions and individuals who have great wealth. They're going to be able to concentrate power um, in ways that other people can't. Um, so is, is, is AI and technology a great savior for the common person at a great leveler or is it a, is it a threat that it's going gonna, it's gonna to lead to a real concentration of power um, in the hands of people that are wealthy? What do you think about that? Well, I, I have one thought or two thoughts on it. One, I would like to be the gentleman who came and spoke at Brian's school recently, who is, um, I think OpenAI was just um, valued at $40 billion or $30 billion, something in those, the nice round numbers. So if you want to concentrate some wealth, come up with some, 
something like open AI, but you know, I do, I do think there are some concerns out there. And when we're talking about regulation, this is one of the areas where it will come up. I was speaking with Colin Rule the other day, and he was telling me about um, we're doing a program together, and his part is the Jetson stuff. He's always like, "What's coming? What's in the pipeline? What's the cool, you know, stuff down the road?" And he was talking about, you know, using AI programming, and Imam will probably be able to speak better to this, but that would be able to be predictive on what a stock was going to do um, in to a level where he's seen it sort of in in practice at a higher level than what currently exists. Obviously, there's probably technology that can do that sort of predictive analysis, but AI taking it to the next level where people have access to that sort um, of technology will be able to um, perhaps an, have an advantage, maybe an unfair advantage in the market if it's not regulated in any way. Um, so I just think of that as one example that perhaps no one's ever, you know, someone is going to think about. People are going to, just as the bad actors out there are coming up with deep fakes using AI in all the different ways, when you come up with these fabulous technologies, we'd like to think everyone's going to be um, ethical and use them in, in, in all ways for good bad actors are always going to find a way to use it for for bad. Um, so those would be concerns without regulation. Uh, Iman, what do, you, yeah. what, do you, what do you think about regulation? Do we need to regulate AI? Um, do we need to legislate? Well, I, um, so if you, I, I feel like AI amplifies things that have always been around. If you look at the introduction of computers into businesses, uh, there was a, you know, probably a 50 X multiplier on productivity. And what we didn't see is that every human being got 50 times richer. What we saw was a consolidation of wealth at the top. Right. Um, and you're going to see the same thing maybe to, you know, um, maybe at a 10 X hundred X magnitude relative to that. Um, that isn't an AI thing, right? The, the fact is what AI does is it an artificial mind is a lot like a human mind and, and the distinction is going to be less and less. It learns from the world. So we, we see authors saying, no, you can't learn from my book. And, and I would say, well, if, if you read a book and you, you learned everything you learned from reading books, what is the distinction between that and AI? But the truth is it takes a problem that exists in our society and it makes it much, much worse, which is um, the fact that wealth is always concentrated, right? But th this is like an economic problem. I think we need to solve that. I think from a pure, you know, look at AI and look at what it's going to do. It's, it's a great thing because all it does is it solves problems, end of the day. But um, don't, I, I, I don't want people to look at it and say, okay, it's this unbiased source of truth. Because if you, ha if you feed it um, a case law, let's say during a, a period of our history that was racist, right? Then, and then you ask it for a verdict, it's going to give you that type of verdict, right? It's only as good as the data that, that it consumes. So you can't say everything AI says is unbiased. It has the bias of the data that, that it used to, to process with. But um, yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, I would hope that it's a forcing function to, for us to look at how economies are, um, are, uh, are, are designed, you know, I, I think it forces some bigger questions. And if there's contradictions in our policies that allow wealth to consolidate, they will get worse, but that is not an implication of what AI is. That is just, uh, an opportunity for us to have better policy. You know, you know, if you watch the national news. You know, pay attention to politics and you see what's happening to the Congress right now. We're pretty polarized in terms of our society, and I'm not sure we're getting better. Um, is there a concern that as as the chatbots become more interactive, and they're to the point now that you can have verbal conversations with them, um, not just text conversations? Is there any concern that that the, the human interaction, that human exchange, uh, are going to decrease even more, which is problematic because if anything, I think we need more human interaction and more conversation between different groups and different entities. Is there any concern that this is going to 
going to make that polarization even worse. Um, that we're going to have less interaction, less human interaction, more more digital technology interaction, and these polarization problems that we're seeing are going to get worse. And he, is, is that a real concern? I, I think what's interesting is that the polarization problem you speak to is probably a result of AI that has been um, creating advertisement and and zeroing in on people that that it thinks think a certain way to get them to move to more extreme positions in order to get them to click, right? So I think the polarization is already a result of AI. And we could look at this as probably the second uh, wave of AI affecting people's lives, this chat GPT wave, because as of 10 years ago, AI was used to optimize ads, which affects everything we see on social media, which affects the way we think. And we see it in election campaigns and, you know, it puts people in certain groups and gives them that amplification where they're not having dialogue. So I think that problem you speak to, the polarization caused by AI, I think it already happened. You think it's going to get worse? You think, you think that that's, I mean, we're coming up in an election year where I'm, I got to say, I'm really concerned. I'm concerned about deep fakes and misinformation. Um, do you think that this is a problem that, that it, I think I agree with Iman that it is a problem. Is it going to get worse? And if we think it's going to get worse, is there anything we can do about it? Well, I, I think the question becomes, I mean, do we need to catch up with the technology or does the technology need to catch up to us? And I, I think that it's a little bit of both. And so um, at least in the legal field, we're pretty resistant to change. And it's going to put some pressure on lawyers to rethink how they go about things. It's going to put pressure on uh, law schools to think about how we assess skills. We have a next-gen bar exam coming. How is this going to change how we as a society deal with conflicts and dialogue and interaction? So I, 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 my prediction would be uh, similar to Imad's. I, I, think, I think similar to you, David, this is going to get worse before it gets better as we learn how to adapt to it. And, and sort of link the human processing of things with the artificial intelligence so that we can make good decisions. Ultimately, I hope it makes us smarter, um, right? There's more information. It's a better tool. That should be a leveler. Um, but it, it, it's, it's a scary and kind of new world. Uh, I'm not confident in our government's ability to regulate at, at this point. We've, we've sort of uh, crossed the line where we've politicized our bureaucracy in so many ways. Um, that it, it, it's, it's, these questions are so complicated, it's, it's not clear um, how that could look. You think that we could become over-dependent on AI, that uh, we will start looking to that technology to, for solutions to things that we used to think through ourselves? Number one, do you think we can become over-dependent? And if we become extremely dependent, is that, a, is that even a problem? What do you think about that? That's actually something that's occurred to me as I use it. And uh, so I pop up in the morning and need to, you know, put out a post or, or write an article or do something like that. And instead of stretching my brain to come up with some, some ideas on what to write about before I've had enough coffee, I'll just have chat GPT generate 15 ideas that I might write about. Um, and so I do, and then I've wondered, am I, you know, when am I setting myself up? I'm not testing my brain this morning. Should I be doing, you know, word puzzles so I don't um, have um, degenerative brain issues later on? But I do wonder, right? Like as, as we have a younger generation, you know, we talk all the time today about how, you know, our youth are much more used to interfacing with their devices than they are with each other. I've seen my own stepkids, you know, text each other well in the same room as opposed to having a conversation. Um, and so wondering to that extent, as we become more dependent on chat GPT being the creator or helping us be creators, will will we start to lose some of, of those, um, those skill sets uh, as we've started to lose them because of our dependence on social media for information and guidance and what we're going to wear today and eat tomorrow. I, tell you, I, th I feel like we're just starting our conversation, um, but unfortunately, we're beginning to run out of time. So um, 
uh, I guess, in our closing minute or two, any final thoughts that, that people can share? Um, maybe we'll start with Brian, go to Iman, and come back to Susan. You know, I, I think it's exciting. I know the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy says anything created after you turn 35 is uh, junk and you don't want any part of it. And before that, it's exciting. But I, I think that um, these are interesting tools and it's exciting to see where technology goes. And I, I don't think there's anything that can replace uh, human relationships. And I, I'm hopeful that as we move forward, we'll, we'll be able to integrate in ways that are beneficial to everybody. Iman, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think um, AI uh, is inevitable. You know, the fact that it's going to be a part of uh, everybody's life. And I think uh, whether to embrace it or not, I don't think that's that it should be controversial. I think, um, you know, balls in our court to really think deeply on issues because uh, I think um, it does amplify uh, any uh trends in humanity that that might um that might need to be fixed i think it's unfortunate that these are not the problems that that we think our uh government is in a um position to solve or as as a society that we're really paying much attention to we're probably paying more attention to polarization uh for the sake of polarization than, than these really hard problems but i am hopeful that you know we will um, reap some major benefits that it's going to free up human time. And I think what we should hold our elected representatives to the standard is if AI is freeing up um, time and is, is, is driving productivity, then why isn't that shared? Why, why can uh, a couple of people, a couple of companies, um, a you know, small percentage reap all of that, which is essentially based on the collective knowledge of, of humanity. Um, so I, I, I am uh, optimistic because I think that at the end of the day, we're going to save a lot of time. We're going to up-level what we do. And I hope that we find a way where that translates into um, parents spending time with their kids, people spending time with their family, and it doesn't translate into, you know, outsized profits. Yeah. Uh, quickly, last word, Susan. Yeah, well, I would just, you know, I would back up everything that both Brian and Iman said, but I would also, you know, the word that, that Iman used that I, I really resonate with is this is exciting. Uh, this is an exciting time where we have a lot of opportunity to do what we do, but do it better with this assistive technology. Um, unfortunately, something else Brian said that really rings true is, at least in our profession, lawyers not really good with change, not really great for adopting new things. And um, I think it's going to hurt our profession. Um, and I do think those that will adopt and do get excited are, are going to reap those benefits. We are the best people to move forward with it. We have ethical, I mean, people in our practice, we, we have ethical guidelines. We live our lives based on certain, in our practice, based upon um, certain ethical beliefs and and mores. And so it's already built into our DNA as attorneys, I hope and believe, uh, to use this properly um, and take the time to learn how to use it properly. So I encourage my colleagues out there to um, to get on the bus because it's not going away. Well, thank you. Th thank all of you. I thought it was a great discussion. Um, thank you to Think Tech Hawaii for sponsoring this program. And, uh, and I look forward to our next discussion. I hope we can get together again.